we had some fun a couple nights ago making medieval mussel and lake stew or soup. Mm -hmm. so that's a recipe that sounds delicious. Yeah, do you like mussels? I love mussels. You would love this then. It was really good. And, um, you know, part of me says, you know, really, how much does cooking change? You know, it's kind of the same basic meats. It's kind of the same basic spices. Um, but the medievals did like saffron. They really loved their saffron. Um, it is kind of cool either way, though, to make a recipe that dates all the way back to 1390 and see what it's like. Yeah, the closest I've come to that when I was in uh, college in acting school uh, for our movement class one year, the, the whole movement class was Renaissance because you have to learn these movement, like body postures and, and movement styles for doing like Shakespeare or something. So um, um, how does uh, Renaissance movement for an actor differ from like a modern actor? Oh gosh, you're asking me to remember something from like 30 years ago. <laughs> Don't admit how long ago it was. Uh, much, much straighter stance. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if you, I watched this fascinating video not too long ago, actually on YouTube, going back to the days when people wore soft shoes, and when you wear soft shoes, and if you try this, try this with soft shoes, you will find mm -hmm. yourself naturally walking toe heel instead of heel toe. Anyway, so uh, in that class, aside from, for whatever odd reason, her, my, the movement teacher, having me learn the female movement. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I don't know why she did that, but she did. Um, you have something to talk about years later. That's why. Uh, we had <laughs> a, a Renaissance dinner, uh, and I was oh. in charge of food for this dinner. Mm -hmm. And so I, there was happened to be in the school library, in the college library, a book of Renaissance, like a Renaissance cookbook. Mm -hmm. uh, and I made parsnip pie, oh, uh, which was really good. At least I liked it. I'm not sure mm -hmm. everybody else cared for it. <laughs> I'm wondering if my book, oh yeah, it happens to be right behind the computer. So this is the one I put together. I don't know if you knew that I had done this and it has oh. a lot of medieval recipes in it. And so this is what we took it from. And uh, just to put in a plug here, as long as we're talking about it, it turns out that four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie, not just a rhyme, they actually did that. And they, yeah, it's amazing, they had a method. By the time I finished this, I was like, you know, medieval people have a really bad rap from modern people. Um, they were so creative with their food, they had fun with their food, like they knew how to make a boar's head breathe smoke. Um, they literally knew how to bake a pie that when the king opened it, blackbirds or whatever birds flew out, they had a way of, <laughs> this is really funny, they put what appeared to be a baked roasted chicken in front of the king, he'd go to dig in and the thing would get up and start running around the table. <laughs> It's fascinating how they did that. And I'm pretty sure that, um, I'm, I'm not gonna give it away. Um, you'd probably get charged with animal cruelty if you did it today. Oh, um, probably. Was, yeah, but even like um, going beyond food, one of the things that Chris and I have been working on like forever and one day we're gonna finish it is called Theology of Music. And we discovered in the process that in medieval times they used all seven modes, whereas today we use major and minor, basically. Mm -hmm. And so you start putting all these together and you go, okay, apart from the horrible brutality, <laughs> it was an amazing time. I mean. Okay. Uh, so the first beer is uh, Green Belt Premium. Well, Minnesota's beer. I did a whole chapter in my uh, guidebook to breweries on Green Bell Premium, truly Minnesota's beer. Fascinating history that I won't go into because it's a long one. Um, Green Bell Premium uh, is an old uh, Minnesota-based American-style lager. Um, it's, it, it falls into the discount lager category. Discount uh, lager? Brewing shells Brewing down in New Ulm, Minnesota. 
the reason uh, I right. have to go with the first reading is because of location. Now, sometimes I just get a really good picture of the location that I see the, the reading happening in. And I always want to put the caveat in, I might be completely wrong. <laughs> but, but when I read the reading, because I, I only read the reading, I haven't read any of the rest of the, the book. So when I read the reading, I pictured these characters in kind of a seedy apartment full of tech equipment and ashtrays full of roaches, not bug roaches, but marijuana roaches. <laughs> and probably some, probably some uh, empty beer bottles here and there strewn about. I noticed that both uh, Shannon and, and I are laughing. Here, obviously. So I went for a discount lager in a bottle. So therefore, green. So, and I get why you think that. I actually did go on to Amazon and read the, the beginning. And um, that's not quite the way it was. <laughs> But I figured I not, could be wrong in this instance, but, but he's, the setting is a little bit wrong. But he's got the characters right. Like there are scenes in That's this true. book where you know you walk into the apartment and there's you know empty whiskey bottle and stuff laying around, and the characters like especially my hacker um, Audrey, she is like her her apartment is a, a like a total dive. Um, she's more like <laughs> right. a room from a stripper. So like, yeah. she's, like her apartment is really like, that's her. So the fact that you have a discount beer, cause she is all about like, she's not much of a drinker cause she can't afford it. Alcohol is expensive. You know? <laughs> so you, so you actually got it pretty close with in terms right, of character, so, so I, not so much. So setting, but we're good. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think it's good that we're actually talking about the setting because when I read just the outtake, I was really confused at first about who is Jay and who is Nikki and who is Aubrey and who is Mia, I was not at all sure what was going on. So it's great to set the setting. Um, there is a heist being planned and we'll get more into that. So this is actually a very high class apartment that has been rented by this very wealthy pair of cousins who are Jay and Mia. And they've hired all these, um, for lack of a better term, kind of low lifes you know, who, as, as Shannon said, really do fit. Or, I'm sorry, in this case, you're Sloan. <laughs> yes, it was. that's fine. <laughs> For this reading, we're talking to Sloan. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of teasing. But, um, so, yeah, it's interesting that she's right. You nailed the characters because Nikki and Aubrey are really um, from a very different world than the apartment that they're in. So we are ready for reading number one. Go ahead. Okay. It takes a theme. It takes a thief, and um, this is just the team is just starting to come together. So, oh, we forgot to taste the beer. Oh, oh. yeah, sorry. <laughs> well. That's okay. I don't have another glass, so we'll click the can Here. today. I forgot you know, like the details. Before. No. <laughs> and you know what? From the moment I saw Grain Belt in my text, I was like, what have I done to deserve this? <laughs> Cheap, cheap kind of beer for the people who can't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, anybody who feels bad they can't afford beer, as far as I'm concerned, you're not missing anything on this one. You found some really good ones that I like. This one, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead with uh, It Takes a Thief. Okay, so um, this is the very beginning when the team is just starting to come together. Um, they're at the apartment that they've rented as a headquarters, and Mia has just insulted Audrey and that she left. Um, so this is uh, Jay, Nikki the thief, and Audrey the hacker um, together in this space. Jay came back to where Audrey waited. From the corner of her eye, she saw Nikki leaning on the back of the couch, giving this scene far more attention than the TV on the wall. Figuring she was about to lose this gig before it even started, she continued her rant. Look, she started with her hands up. I don't know what game you're playing, flirting with me every time we talk. Maybe you were thinking about slumming it, but it was douchey. His eyes flashed for a second. Conversations go both ways. If you didn't want to talk, you could have shut it down anytime you wanted. Therein lay the problem. She hadn't wanted to shut it down. She enjoyed the banter. She couldn't afford to think about that now. That was before I knew you were involved. 
I don't know what your girlfriend's problem is unless she found out how you talk to other women, but I'm not going to put up with someone looking down on me and calling me a junkie. What? She's not my girlfriend. She hadn't clocked a ring on the woman's hand, so not wife. And the total look of horror on his face almost made Audrey laugh. Of everything she'd said, that was the one thing he homed in on? Definitely defining boundaries. You sure about that sport? Nikki asked. The way you two fight, when you see that movie, you know they're hitting the sheets in a few minutes. Audrey could have sworn he turned green. She's my partner. My purely platonic partner. That's all. He took a deep breath and scrubbed a hand over his face. While he didn't say the words, his eyes held an apology for the misunderstanding. Something else simmered there, drawing Audrey out. Too bad she sucked at reading people. I don't know, Nikki continued. I feel a sexual tension in the air. Audrey swallowed. She was feeling it now, too, except it had nothing to do with Ms. Green and everything to do with the man standing in front of her. Then he blinked, breaking whatever spell he'd been weaving. We've been planning this job for a long time. She's worried about being successful. For everything to work, we need a functioning team. Audrey rolled her eyes and Nikki snorted. What, he asked, looking back and forth between Audrey and Nikki. You think your partner views us as a team, Audrey asked. She will. Why don't you set up the equipment the way you want and we'll start fresh tomorrow. So, not fired. Audrey looked over to where the boxes of equipment stood. She wanted to play with everything. Was it worth putting up with someone who assumed she was an addict? Walking to the massive elf-shaped desk, she tossed her hat on a chair, letting her hair fall to her shoulders. Fine, but if she insults me again, I'm out. Nick.